okay, this presentation, uh, it has three three parts. One, the first part is the basics, and then the part two is the uh, is the format, which is the one we just discussed: documents and uh, you know output output. The part three is the uh, is the workflow that I'm going. If we have a time, so we will go to part three and we will present some tips of how we can use our account to, to make your work easy. Okay, so again, my name is Ai Chen Chen and I go by Sky. Okay, let's start. Okay, so introductions. Uh, Ang uh, files are used in three different ways. Is that you can use it to like uh, uh, communicate with your your boss, <laughs> such as so that they can you can you can hide your code so you don't have to gener generate any like a uh, uh, analysis. And also the other thing is you can use it to uh, communicate with uh, data scientists, including yourself, in, because in the in the R markdowns you can write down your conclusions, your thoughts. Okay. And then the other thing is just like what you guys have a like one uh, calling has just have been using it as a lab notebook, which in this ways you can you can capture what you did and also what you think. All of them put in one notebook. Okay, it will. So that's how people usually use. Uh, why we use R Markdown? The, the benefit of R Markdown and the you know the the extension. Okay, the the R Markdown resources is uh, the the chichi that we have from the the R Studio that you can get these two chichis from the R Studio. One of them is R Markdown chichi. The other is the reference guide. You can download them from there. So. The the uh, Amazon basic and the, so we as we do you guys all know that the Amazon basics that is different from the R file that one of them is the extension is RMD right RMD so this is a, this is an example like some of you may or uh, uh, already familiar with Amazon so in, in this examples Amazon sizes right so the the file is the extensions is R a R M D. So at the beginning, it has a header. It has a header, and then it has some code, code chunk that is surrounded by some like uh, dash dash dash, and also it has uh, has some text file, right? So this is an example of what a R mark a simple R markdown look like. It is usually, you know, and you can look at when you look at the, how it goes. Is when you generate the output, the output is going directly below the code. It's not a go, it's not in the console. So, so here is uh, like uh, what is the, is what the example can, can, contains, like the the, a, the YML header, the the, the code chunks, and then the some text. So this is uh, the examples from this is like from the examples I just show you. Okay, so after you write your R markdown, so what uh, methods you can use to generate your output? Uh, anyone have answers? I've, <laughs> I've only generated the output and then taken screenshots of it. <laughs> so um, I'm sure there's a better way. <laughs> okay. So one of the way we can do it is by using need. So let me show you like, a, my R Studio. So this is my R Studio. And uh, for example, in my present, my presentation is generated by R Markdown, right? So in, in front of the on, the, on the upper left, this a uh, bottom called need. So in my, so this is my presentation. And uh, when I put, when I like click need, it, it tells you that, oh, you can need it to this kind of uh, presentation because uh, this is where my output is. Hey Sky, um, hey Sky. I think you're only sharing your um, your your presentation, so we can't see your R Studio. Oh, okay. Let me see how. So, oh, okay. Oh, you are, you are. Oh, that's why. Okay, I see. Uh, let me show you the. Let me show you my. Stop sharing, right? And then, okay. Let me show you my R. Uh, like, okay, can you see my R Studio now? Mm -hmm. okay.
this is, for example, this is how I generate this presentation. I write in the R Markdown. So R Markdown presentation basic dot RMD. And how I, after I write the file, how I generate it is I look, uh, I press the need and it says need to this presentation, right? So after I, I can click it, it will generate the file and the file, it will go directly to look, you will generate this file. And then the file will go directly to your, to your folder. You can, okay, so let me, okay, let's, let's continue because I can still, still using this one because no, it is generated again, but I, I can just use it, right? I don't have it to. So are you guys in studio? Can you still see my presentation? Just our, just the, uh, the R studio. Oh, just the R studio. Yeah. Can you, oh, this is interesting. So I have to see because, okay. Yeah. And then I'm going to share the presentation back. Like it's like that. Okay, so how it generates, you know, we can click the need button, but inside it, it was generated by this, uh, this, this workflow. Like at very, very beginning, we write the R markdown. We need it by click the bottom. The need button, it will create a file called MD. The, the extension will be MD. And then this MD file, is it will run all your code in the R markdown and save it in this file. After that, it will send to another uh, function or, uh, or, or some, some place in the disk is called pen doc. And this pen doc will generate all your outputs. So, so your, your output can be a novel, can be a HTML, can be a, no, a presentation like what I just, like, like what I'm doing here. And it can be a website. And uh, or dash, dashboards, things like that. We will go over that in part two. Okay, so that's how. You no, know, and this way, uh, I give you like an example of how uh, a markdown file look like, and also how you how you can generate the output. But inside the markdown, do you know that we have a we have a code, and some sometimes we we can also write a text, right? So if you write a text, you will have to format your text. So that's uh, that's the uh, how you can format for text formatting. So this is how you format some of the text in R Markdown. If you want to put, you can put your text as a italic by putting a you know a star in front of the in front of your uh, your fold, in front of the words, or you can put two. If you put two star, it become bold. Or if it's a code. Then you put the, I think this is like a dash dash. Yeah, back tick. Okay, back tick. Yeah. And also the, you can also write a subscript and or a, or a superscript, right? And text formatting, you can also write a list in your R marked out. By, by using the star star, and if you inside the list, you can put, a, you, you, you can like uh, use the tab and then make another start. So it's a list inside a list. The other way you can do it is by using a number, by using one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so that's a, a different way you can, uh, you can put a list in the R marked out. The, uh, you can also put, you can also link, put your link and the Im images in the R marked out. So that's the, how you can do it. You can put, uh, you know, the, that's one way you can put the link. The second way you can put in a link is by putting a, a brackets in front of the link, right? And then there's some op option captions. You can put captions for in your in your images too. So that's how you can format a link and the, and the, then also input some of the pictures in your in your R markdown. And table. So in so that's the like a, how how in R markdown you can form you can form format of tables. So this is a more compli com complicated way to do it, that you have to write your header and then put some, oh, that's very complicated. So I, I'm gonna show you an easy way to write a table. So in this way, so you know how we, if we do it, well, if we write the, the empty cards, how it generates the table. This is the same formats that we see in the console, in the R console. It was it was displaced like uh with some of the the symbols in front of each road. So in R Markdown, you want to make it more pretty. How you can make it more pretty? 
you by adding the cable, the cable function. So look, this is the same same table that I just showed you. But if you put a cable, need and then a cable in front of the in front of this table, it will look much more prettier. So you can do you can see like by comparing with that, right? Look this should be equal. Yes. So, oh, okay. It's not talking to me. And, okay, so that's how you can format some of your, your R Markdown in uh, how you can format some of your uh, text table and the links in your R Markdown. Can, yes, Scott, can, you, go back, can you go back to the cable? Yes. The cable part? Yeah. Okay. So just by putting in cable function, then you have empty cars. And then caption gives you the title. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then it, uh, so cable um, has to do with like some, there's some basic formatting associated to, to cable. Was that right? Yes. Look how yeah. like the, the Nick cable, it will give you the, the row name, the column name, and it will give, actually give you like a, you no, know, make it look really pretty. Look, you can do. So you can see by comparison. So yeah. this is the same thing that you see from from the other one, right? So it look make it looks nice. This is when people want to do a publication, they want to make it look nice. So I, I'll just quick jump into. Um, I know there's another package called Cable Extra, and it allows you to do even more formatting as well. Um, like it will allow you to like do striping and change the headers. It's called cable extra. And then all you have to do is you can just pipe off of the NITR cable. I think you just pipe off of it and then you can add all of your different formatting to it. There's another package called GT that I think does a little bit better job of tables, but um, you can use cable from my experience, but yeah, just a, just a comment. Yes, that's, there are uh, some other like uh, uh, packages, and uh, uh, you can make it, the tables look pretty in the in your final files. Okay, okay. So, any other questions? If not, we are going to move to uh, the code part. Okay, in the code part. So you know you want to you know in the R markdown, you want to you run your code right when you when you write your code in the R markdown. You want to know how you can format your code and how you can run it. Okay, so the way you can do it, how you can put a code, you want to make it dip differentiate from the rest of the text, right? So the way you can do it is one of them is like using the shortcut. The other is in the R Studio. You can just put you can just put the insert button. And it will allow you will generate a chunk that you can input your you you can input input your code. The other way, which is the one that I usually use, I just manually type the you no know, back tip back tip and then uh, ah. So that's how I how I usually do it manually. But there are three different ways you can input code into your R markdown. So in your R markdown. In R markdown, that uh, you know, like in when once you have a, once you have a, a, a chunk of code, you want to give it a name. So why you want to give it a name? Because maybe you will have a, like a multiple uh, chunk of code. You can some of them maybe used for like plot, some of them for table, but you want to give them a name. So if you have a, like a, a several page R markdown, you, you can find. You can find your chunk of you can find your code very easily, okay. Just by looking at one of the function, one of the bottoms in R Markdown in the R Studio will enable you to find it easily. So that's why, like, some will give them a code a name. And also, the other thing is that you know, when you have a, a R Markdown code, you sometimes we want to give them chunk options. So chunk option was confusing to me at the very beginning. So what does chunk option do? Because you guess what? Because sometimes you want to run your code, you write your code and you want to show like how you run it. You want to show like your code in your final file, right? Sometimes you don't want to, 
don't want to evaluate your code. Sometimes you don't like uh, don't want to show your code. Sometimes you just don't want to like show the, the messenger or warning. So this is some of the options that you can input in your R Markdown trunk code. So let me give you a uh, tables and then you will see how you will see like evaluate is equal to false. It means what? It okay, let's read uh, this table and then, uh, and then answer the questions. Evaluate is equal to false. What does it do to your code? Can someone answer from this table? So it will run the code. Is that right? Does the, when you, when you have the mark, does that mean it does that or it doesn't do that? It, it was suppressed. It was suppressed. suppressed the, the function. You will suppress this function. Okay. So eval equals false means that it will only show the code. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So what does, uh, let's say echo equal to false. What does it mean? So include equals false only runs the code. Uh, I saw that include was mean included in the document and eval was running the code, but I don't know what mean echo. Oh, echo. Echo, it just means that uh, you, you, are, you were not going to show your code in, the, in your final file. For example, you, if you like a run, you if you have a bunch of code, right? But in your PDA, in your final file, you don't want to show your code. You only want to show the results. You want to evaluate and show your results. So, so, so in, what's so, the difference with include? Because include, include, it will run your code, but it's not going to do the rest of them. It's not going to. It will not show your code. Okay. Just the same as the. Okay, the, so even, right? okay, even and echo we get include, okay. Yeah, yeah. So this function is like is not going to show you the code, but include equal to false is also there. It's not going even to give you the give you output. It will only give you, you will only run your code, and you will not show the result. You are not going to show the plot or messenger or any errors. You you so, but then you will have these variables. In that you can use for the rest of the for the rest of the code. And that's if include equals false or include equals true. Include equal to false. Okay. Okay. So this was some of. So the other the other things that uh, uh, is uh, sometimes will bother you is that some of your computations will take a long time. What do you do if you have a computation that you are not going to wait and sit there for a long time? For a for like a, a for a long time, right? So one uh, options is so this is one of the options in the chunk that you can use is by using catching is equal to true. So what does what no catching is equal to choose? I haven't been like a have a very big file that I have to use this function yet, but uh, is uh, what it does is that it will generate. It will generate the, the results of your code, and then it will put in a special place in the disk. And then, when next time when you run the code, when you run the same file, this the, this uh, R file is going to check the special disk and see okay if the result is the same or not. If nothing change, then you will just you will just like uh, get you the output without doing any additional computation. So you will save your time. So that's what catching is equal to true. It, this is what it does. So for example, in this file, it says, okay, we are reading a very large file, right? But next time I don't want to read this file anymore. I just want to you know, save this file someplace in a special disk. And then the next time I just want to use it. So I was using catching is equal to true. And then it will next time it will it will says okay the raw data we will just use it directory, and then run the rest of the code. You and so that's what it catching is equal to. That's what it does in the is one of the options. It by setting catching is equal to true. 
So I, I wanted to quick jump in there, Sky, because I want to make sure I understand this because I thought this was a, a pretty neat option that I didn't know about. Um, so like with your example here with like process data, the only thing that we're caching here is the process data object, correct? That's what I that's what I took this as because it's caching the output of this chunk right here, that second chunk. Am I right or wrong in that? Uh, so the, the second chunk is, so if you, by set, if you set by catching is equal to true, it means that if something, there's something that you change in the raw, in the raw data, this, this chunk is going to use the, is not going to do anything with this raw, the data, it will only use the original, like the one that you run before. And then it will continue to pipe and then run the rest of the code. Yeah, that, that would make sense. It seems to me that if you have cache equals true on that code on that code chunk, then it's gonna cache process data. Yes, but that's a that's a good question. For example, if something change in your raw data, right? Something change. So this, so this, the rest of look, there's the line two and the line three is depends on this raw data. So if something change in the raw data, and you you want to catch it, so that's the way to do it in, on the next slide. But setting like dependent is equal to raw data. So if you set the dependent is equal to raw data, it will update the results for the catch chunk whenever it detects that one of its dependencies have changed. So if you have to, in this case, you have to set a, a, another a option in order for it to detect that something is changed in the raw data, okay? So that's the raw data object, right? So like if we go back, so if we go back to the previous slide and we see that we're defining raw data based off of that read CSV, it's gonna depend on that raw data object, not the file. So in that case, it's only going to cache the raw data, or it's only going to depend on that raw data object. But if I go and change the file, you know, a very large file.csv, it's not going to, that's not going to matter. It's not going to, it's not going to see it as a change. You see what I'm asking? If I'm, if I'm getting that correct, because I think there's another option you might be talking about it next where it's like, depends on extra or something that I saw. And then you could like use that depends on extra to watch the file itself on your system, I think is what I yeah, was thinking yes. of. So yes, that's the one that I, I saw it like from the book, but I didn't conclude, I didn't include it in this presentation. There is an option that you can actually detect something is uh, like changed in your, in your file, you're right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I because when I was reading through that, it made sense to me. But then I also felt that, you know, you could it's kind of a you could kind of catch yourself if you think you could kind of have a false sense of, you know, security, thinking that it's going to going to be able to help you if you change the file. But in this case, it doesn't. So you need to use that cache extra. I can't remember what our depends on extra or something. So. Yes, that's, a, that's a one, one extra little thing that you need to do in order to detect the change in the file itself. Yeah, I thought it was cool, but then I was sitting there, I was like, I could also see where I could, it could create a false sense of security for me too, so. So does it keep um, the, does it keep the cache across sessions and across like system restarts and everything like that? Or is it only that individual session? I think it's only like uh, if you put, for example, is this chunk of code, right? And the catch is equal to true. It only apply to this small chunk of code, and then the rest of them is just normal. Yeah, but then if if you do that and then you restart your computer the next day or whatever, does it still have access to that, or is it just temporarily for that session for that day? Yeah. Okay, that's a, that's a good question. I have to look into it. Okay. My my assumption would be that if you are like restarting your R session, so like if you're doing like a shift control F10, like clearing it, starting with a clean slate, I would assume that clears your cache. But that's just a gut feeling of mine. 
Yeah. And I mean, I could probably check it here in a second, but I would think if you start when I, I was always taught that shift control F10, when you clear your session, it's a blank slate and you're starting new. So I don't think the cache would stay, but I'll double check. Yeah. Okay. Cause I could definitely use that, but uh, like across sessions, across days, you know, so. I bet there's a, there's a way that we can figure out how to do it for across days. Okay, now let's go to global options. Global option is a, it's like a, you want to apply some of the options to your entire file, not just one small chunk. So global options is a, you you are putting it like usually I put it in front of my uh, in front of my uh, everything else. So one of the ways that we can set is by using like set and then put whatever you want in front in inside a inside a function. So and then preparing a report. Sometimes when people preparing a report, they don't want to show any code, right? They on, they only want to show results and the and the, the 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 text. So you can just put it okay set and then equal is equal to false. So again, what does equal equal to false mean? Anyone remember? So when you prepare a report, you don't want to show any code, right? So that means uh, let's go back to our table. It means uh, equal equal to false. It means you, you don't want to show any code. You are suppressed, you are suppressed showing code, okay? So that's what it means. But then it does everything else except showing code. That's, where, that's what you want to do when you are preparing a report. Okay, so inline code. Inline code is, uh, let me give you an example. And uh, this, this small things is not supposed to be here. I tried hard to get rid of it, but it is still there. So this example, they say, we have a data about R and row diamonds. So we want to show like uh, the, how many row of diamonds. And uh, this code is not a chunk. It's in line, it's in the sentence. So how do you do it? You do it by you now putting like a, a back tick, back tick, and then inside a quote, just one, right? So the result of this quote, it will be, we have a data about 53,940 diamonds. So this, it will run the code in your once you generate your file. That, that's in my code. Uh, parameters. Parameter is something that also very interesting. Okay. Uh, oh, I have uh, examples about like uh, uh, parameters. So let me go to uh, my, my, let me go to my stop sharing and go to my file to show you like the example. Okay, let me go to my files to show you the example. So right now we are in, you, you guys can see my Amakta uh, and my R Studio. Mm -hmm. So what uh, what parameters do? Did you guys, uh, have you guys used uh, like a parameter before? Once. Uh, let me get the, Parameter thing. Let's talk. Ah, yes. Uh, I'm not done. Uh, that's the, the fuse that the fuse I'm not done. Okay, so you can see like in this same, in these examples, right? I have my R marked out. So this is the header. And then this is my first paragraph. I, I have a setup that including the, the libraries. The second is that we, I have, I'm going to run this code. And one of them like P-A-R-M-A-S is a color parameter. Can you guys see that uh, I said my classes is equal to SUV. And then I is use SUV in, in my code by, by, by putting like parameters and then my classes. So this will be equal to this. this what this means is just means classes. Class is equal to SUV. 
so if the next times I want to put like a not I, I want to put so let me run it okay let me run it and you will see like like the results the results will be generated by in just underneath the code in this case right if in this case, if you, so that's what parameters do. What the benefit of par parameters is, uh, if you set the parameters here, and uh, you can just change it. Let's say next time, I don't want to put uh, my classes is equal to SUV. My classes, I want to put uh, something else. For example, uh, what, what, what else? Let me see what other classes I can have, like the MPG, uh, the classes, let's say, uh, let's say empty class, right? Uh, classes have uh, how many different kind of classes we have for empty car? But that's uh, I think is there like four WD? I think might be one. Four WD. Or four wheel drive. SUV. What other classes we have that we could mean? Oh, I think, well, wait, because I think, because uh, I think the empty cars just, well, wait a minute, a second. No, maybe I'm wrong. How come they? Yeah. I think it's because it's pulling in the MT cars from the library tidyverse. Yeah. Try 4WD. It sticks in my mind that 4WD is an option. Like a 4WD? Yeah. 4WD? Is that right? Yeah. Okay, let me run it. Oh, it looks like yes. <laughs> and then we can run it and it give you the, oh. Or not. <laughs> anyway, I, 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 I don't know how to find the classes now, but it is the, the parameter is that you can set, you can change it, like right? once you know like one. Do, do, we need, do we need to rerun? How does he know exactly what is the name? Oh, okay. Do, how, does, um, how does a computer know that change the parameter? Uh, can you say your questions again? It's just that, okay, we put it on the top. But we are... Sandra, you're kind of breaking up, but you were asking how does the computer know that you've changed yeah. the parameter? Yeah. Do we have to oh, on? Because, you know, when you set it, when you, that's why, like, when you set the parameters in the header. And then you and set it? will assign, the, the, your computer will assign whatever, uh, classes you have to my classes and uh, because this is a this is equivalent to uh, my classes is equal to this uh, variable and, and we don't need to rerun do you have to save it again or rerun or yeah. you have to run it again yes okay yeah okay let me stop sharing so that's what because sometimes you have a lot of the because this is the Convenient when sometimes you have a lot of uh, parameters in your in your R markdown in your uh, in your R file and you cannot remember or whatever you write right so you want to set it at the very beginning and one whenever you want to uh, change your parameters you can just you know change it in at the beginning of the, the parameters is for you know, for convenience. Okay, the is that, is that preferable to just creating a variable? though just creating a new object that says like um you don't know car car type and car type equals suv and car type equals anyone have, uh anyone have a, this is a good very good question because uh, uh i think they are equivalent anyone have other like a, a source i wonder if it keeps it all in one object though because i noticed that there was a an object in your environment called params or parameters mm -hmm. it might keep all of those together under the under that single object of parameters oh. rather than creating a new object for every single one that you want to do i don't know maybe you can make a list 
Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it might be just one big list, right? Mm -hmm. You can make a big list. Yeah. I was, I was looking at it because I was interested in that question too. Like, what is that object? Like if you set, if you set a params, what is that object? And I, I checked the class and it's its own special class called knit underscore pram list. So it's a list type, but it's specifically, I think it's tailored to the knit R package, which I, it's kind of neat. Your other, uh, another answer that, another answer that I have for you, cause I had that too, is why wouldn't you just use a, a variable or specify another variable? And then I thought about it. Well, like the example in the book was what if you have multiple reports that you want to do and you can keep replacing that like variable. So like you have a variable outside of that report that gets imported into it every time to run separate reports. Mm -hmm. So you won't necessarily be able to create a report if you have that variable in it because it has to come outside of it to actually run the separate reports for whatever it may be. Cool. That was my thought anyways. Yeah. Thank you for answering. Okay, the last piece of this basic uh, presentation is the bibliography. So right now we already cover how we can uh, know the basic of uh, how to run a R markdown. We cover uh, the text formatting, how you can put uh, the code chunk, right? How you can run the, the, the chunk of code in R markdown. And also we cover how you can put, set the parameters. And the other, the last piece is, you know, whenever you write a book or you write a presentation, you want to including bibliography and the citations, right? So one of the, the way that you have a, so in order to do the bibliography, you actually in, in your header, you have to include a file, a file and the name is like something, your file, like in this case, I call markdown.bib, right? So this is, a, you can have to save it in the same path of your, you know, your, your R markdown. And then the way you do it, when you have a, like a, a citation, you will put like, at, for example, R for, this is one of the citation I did. It's like at the R for data science, right? R for data science, R for data science. So it's putting a, a, at in front of your, in front of your sentence, at the end of your sentence. So that's uh, how you can put a bibliography. There are several ways that you can generate, you can put your citations in your file. So that's, of course, the first step, you always want to include in your bib, this dot bib file. Otherwise it's not going to generate, uh, it will give you an error. So there's uh, like a four different ways you can sign in your R markdown. You, you can put a, a, a semicolon and then you can like uh, add arbitrary comments. And you can also put a, uh, you know, uh, suppress the author's names or you can remove it to including like in text citations. There, uh, those are four different ways that you can put citation. So in your R markdown. So that's uh, citation usually when do it, when you want to, when you want to do like publications. So it, you, for example, our the book that we are, we are reading is called R for Data Science is actually written in R markdown. So I, so that's why uh, I, when I generate these presentations, I can, I can just grab the, grab the, the quote from, from this Armagdown book. And then, uh, and then I, it, it makes, makes me like a very easy to generate this presentation. You can change it from uh, the presentation to book, to website, to dashboard. So the next, this is what we are going to talk about. The next step is uh, the next, the next step is uh, how, like what different format you can, okay, let me cancel it first. The next step, the next presentation part two is uh, what kind of output that we can get from the AMA down. As, as I already told you, we can, uh, you can make a book, you can make a website, you can make a presentation, just what I already showed, right? And then the next, let me show you the presentation, this part two, okay? Part two. Wait for a minute. 
Let me grab the presentation. Okay, and then show you the share the screen. Okay, so that's the part. That's part two. So in this part two, uh, we I so that's the uh, Markdown documents. You can generate uh, HTML documents. So in this this presentation, like my presentation file is in the HTML formats. You you can set up like a multiple options options too. You can set up uh, award options in just in the vote in the header of your R Markdown. And there are two ways to set the output. One is by setting a header. The other is by using the render function. Okay. The other thing that I want to show you is that, uh, okay, that's what I was talking about. Like you can put like HTML documents and then set two different formats, TOC and the TOC float. And in addition to that, you can set uh, add another one called PDF documents. So one once you once you write a one R markdown, you can you can print out many different formats for you by setting it in the in the header. So that's the kind of things that you can put in in your format: a PDF, a Word document, a ODT document, a RTF document, the MD document, and then a GitHub documents. So all this is uh, available to generate your outputs. So I think the most of them, I most of times I generate as a PDF or as a Word. The rest of them, I barely use them at all. Just to be clear, we need to install. Uh, say your question again. Just to be clear, Word, we need to have computer uh, i cannot hear you okay. sorry it's okay uh, ryan i think you you are you are mute yes yeah i uh i think she was saying that if you um if you want to uh to render it Is in it a word out? document then you have to have a word installed on your computer i don't know the answer to the, that question but i think that was the question Yes, you. Yes, you need you need the word in the, in, the, in, the, in your Windows or in your, in your Windows because Mac don't use you don't use the doc, right? Yes, yeah. yes. Oh, notebook. Notebook is the one that you are that we uh you were, we were just talking about in the very beginning, right? So when you have a when you have a notebooks, is a uh is just similar to the HTM documents, but uh, it give you like a the HTML the HTML notebook. It give you a local preview, and then you can share it like to emails, and then you can create like a minimum MD file. Okay, presentation. Presentation is a presentation is a different another format that, that you can output from your from your uh, R markdown. So, for example, this is a presentation that I generate. You can generate uh you can generate it with the uh, I I O I this is I and O slice presentation, slidey presentation, Beamer presentation. So that will give you the HTML presentation or the PDF presentation. And then the way I generate my presentation is by generating the review.js. So I'm gonna uh, I'm going to show you like how like in my header, right? I think you already see you already see uh, for example here share and in my this is the, the, the bibliography. And then in my presentation, look, I have an output. And then it says review JS. So this is where my output is going to become. You and you up after that, can you see can you see like the need? You if you press the need, it will say, okay, need to review JS 
presentation. Okay, so that's how how a presentation that looks like. So that's a that's a different format that you uh, that you can generate from the R markdown. There's some other interesting formats. For example, dashboards. Dashboard is something that you can generate to present your ideas. Sometimes you don't need a you don't need a PDF or slides. For example, this is a this is a dashboard. This is also something that you you can get from the the R markdown. Because this is interactive, you can change the numbers and you can show people the graph by by not, not by by changing your variables. The other thing is you can also add a HTML widgets to your ArcMart node. So I'm gonna show you an example. This is also interactive. For example, you have a graph, right? And you want to, I, this is how I including it, including this, uh, this, this is called uh, from the leaflet. So this is one of the HTML widgets that I, I got. And I can, the way I can do it is when I, when I do a presentation, if I want to show you, okay, where is the where is the, the grammar school? Okay, oh, the grammar school is here. If you can actually move it, okay. And the, and the, the other, there are more like a small, like a fun ways that you can present your ideas. The other thing that you can you can do is uh, the other package that you can have is the DY graphs, the DT, 3JS, uh, the diagram me, Diagram me R. Those are the package that can, you can use to to get your HTML wedges into your HTML file to present your ideas. And then I bet you guys have already he heard of something called Shiny, right? Shiny is another way that you can generate from your your PDF from your R markdown. You can just by okay, long time is equal to Shiny. This is an example of the Shiny. Okay, let me uh, example of example of a shiny file. So if you want to present or how you can use this histogram in, I have an example here. Let me stop sharing and then, then I give I share the I will share the the example. So let me get my pre presentation hist. His App dot markdown is from like a, a markdown. Let me find it. Where is it? Here's his. Is this is this my own mark? And then in this in this way you will run the run app. It will give you this kind of output. You like this is a shiny app, an example of a shiny. So if I move the look how the histogram change, right? So you can you can represent your uh, analysis to your audience in a very interactive way by showing a shiny app. Okay. I have a question on your other screen, but oh, go ahead, Sandra. Yes, my question is. Um, it's what I have never understood with Shani is how do you share with people? Because, okay, you do it, you show, you present, but can you send it to someone who doesn't have air and really work for him? Yes, you can share your app to other people. So you can, uh, I think the in the book, it says that you can share, the way you can share it is by sending it to some third party server. So you yeah, actually- but Okay, yes, okay, so after like you-, you you can't you can share private um, private information if it's on on server. Okay. Yeah, you can have to save in some kind of server, and I think R Studio allowed you to send it to one of their server for free, but it's limited. Okay. It's yes, but so it won't mark. It won't. Uh, it won't work for business purposes because you are not allowed to share your client data on. Uh, on a Lambda server. So, so it's the reason why is that it's tough to get air in uh, some company because of all this kind of stuff. And the, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. That we're going through that. So, yeah. 
Okay. I well, uh, I guess. Well, there's. I mean, I'll just add a little bit to that. I mean, it's it's how you distribute it. Like we talked about a server, but like if you had somebody who was knowledgeable on how to use R, you could still pass the code so that they can actually run the actual shiny application. But I think the problem that everybody runs into from what I've seen is how do you transfer the data? Like if, I mean, you could transfer a CSV file and you know you could have the CSV file as part of the actual file itself. But like, if you're making a connection into a database or something like that, that's where the real, that's real, what the real issue comes into. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then the other thing that our Markdown can do is can actually generate a, a very pretty website. And you know how they set the index to be the first page. So that's uh, another way that our Markdown is very useful that by creating websites. I'm not showing like an example of websites, but you, because you guys see every day, right? You can actually generate like the, the website that you, you, you see every day. And uh, the last part is that there are other formats available in addition to that we have uh, just discussed. So these are the, uh, like, uh, the packages that you can, can give you even more output. So there are more, more, more outputs that you can, people are making every day from like making packages. Okay, that's the part two. Oh, I can actually, I was, uh, I hope it's not too fast. And the, the last part of this presentation is that we are going to discuss some tips, right? Some tips of how we can actually use our markdown. We will just um, do like a, a group discussion. Let me get the fire now. The part three, let me, sh let me show you like how, how this, Okay, let me show you the part three. Let's discuss some of the tips that we can use our markdown. The workflow, right? Okay, so we, I already uh, discussed the basic and the formats. The last part is the workflow that I'm going to share some tips. Okay, why should you keep a analysis notebook? And uh, let's, let's, ask, let's ask Colin to, to answer these questions. So, because he already keep a notebook. So why do you keep a notebook? What benefits do you have from doing this? Uh, I think it's just documentation, number one, to document what you're doing. And then um, I think that the term that I would use is reproducibility. So if you can document how you're doing things, then if you pass it on to somebody else or pass it on from your future self uh, to your future self, you'd be able to better reproduce to get your results that you did before. Nice. Thank you for sharing. Okay. Yeah. Look. And so here we. Okay. That's another, some additional uh, tips that to keep your notebook. One of them is that uh, ensure each notebook have a descript title. So, and the file name, and also that uh, you always want a, the first paragraph to briefly describe the goal of your analysis. So now, so this is, uh, in the future, when you see your name, the title, the file name, the first paragraph, you will immediately know, okay, what, is the, what does this uh, analysis for? Tip two is uh, you always want to put your date in your header, okay? Number three. If you spend a lot of time on the analysis idea and it turns out to be a dead end, you, for me, I usually like uh, delete it, but it looks like that uh, is not a good idea. You should write, uh, so what this, the book suggests is that we should write a brief note about why you fail this time and then leave it in the notebook. And then it says that uh, the next time when you come back to the same analysis, you will understand what you did before and why you, uh, what error you make in the, in the previously. And uh, this kind of analysis can help you avoid the same errors.
and T4. So you are better off doing data entries outside of R, but if you need to record a small uh, set of data set, clearly laid it out using the tree board. Uh, what it means is that when you are doing your analysis, you, you want to make it neat by setting it to a tree board. Sometimes we have a lot of times we are running, uh, when you are running a very large code uh, or very large data sets, and if you if you want a subset of it, you want to set it into a triple by making it uh, tidied. And the last one is uh, no, tip five is that okay. So that's another good tip because uh, sometimes you sometimes you think you some errors in your data set. I think is very like a. Uh, intuitive that you just want to correct it by hand or you not know, just correct it right away. But uh, it's actually better that you write a code and then correct the value in the R file. Because once once you go back to your data set, you sometimes you not know, you think it's an error, but it's actually it's actually not an errors. And then you have to change back and then you will you will if you didn't record it, you will forget about what you did in your data. So if you always keep your original file and the, you know, if you want to make a change, write a code and, the, and the keep a note. Okay, tip six, make sure you can need the notebook at the end of the date. Okay, that's very important because once you can need your notebook, you will feel satisfied and happy. <laughs> To end your day, this is number seven. Uh, once, oh, that's another thing that I didn't do myself. That you have to check the versions of the package that your code use. I myself, I I have no idea how I can check the versions of the packages. Anyone have any experience? I know that some people they use um, a package called RAM, but I have never used myself. I, I just go in periodically and check on updates. You can go into tools. It's like check for package updates, and then I just run update everything that can be updated. I don't know if that's but, the best way to yeah, do it. Yeah, and but, and the package RAM is supposed to um, to keep a record of all the package use and which version. So after it's supposed to help people to have um, uh, to share code. I've never used myself, but I know that is what we are supposed to use. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, yes, I think like uh, what she say is that you can actually check the versions of the package that you used in your code. Yeah. And then if you just use the update, so I think it just updates all the file, all your packages in your system, but it's not uh, keeping the versions in that the code that you use to run that in that specific R file. Well, the way I think it is is uh, that the, the versions sometimes it have an impact on your on your code. Okay. Oh, actually, it says that the one of the one of the rigorous approach is to use pack rat. Well, it actually stores the packages in your project directory. The other, and also you can use checkpoint. You will restore packages available on a specific date. That's uh, pack rat is actually going to store your packages in your project directory. Interesting. Okay, I think that's the that's a, Oh yes, the, the the last part it says a quick and a dirty check. You can we can actually including a chunk. This is called section in form. That won't let you easily recreate your package as they are today, but at least you will know what they were. 
this is something that I haven't used yet, but you know, it's it's a it's a tips that you know sometimes if you are if you are checking some of your very old uh, file, it has the impact. The package, the version of the packages can have an impact on your out output. Okay, that's the end of the presentation. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> no, it was a lot. Yeah, that was. Uh, I thought that was a great presentation. I yeah. um, yeah, there's so much that I have to learn with all this to practice. Um, so I, I know we're getting close to the end of the time. If anybody needs to jump off, that's fine. I wanted to see um, Sky. It, I wanted to be able to go through all of your code step by step and see it. Uh, I know it was there on GitHub. Yes. Uh, is it just a matter of copying all of that code from GitHub, or is there something else to 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 look at? I have a R markdown. I have all uh, no, the, the source. I have all the source code in the GitHub. Okay, I couldn't figure out how to do it because um, because I haven't really used GitHub before. So it, would would you be able to walk through and show how to how to download it? Oh, the GitHub. Oh, the GitHub is very yeah. You know, it, sometimes I get annoying by this too. It doesn't allow you to download one file or two file. You have to actually download the entire report. Let me okay. show you. Great. So you can go to actually if you want to read the code, right? I, I sign. Let me sign first. You might wanna you might wanna not share your screen if you're gonna sign in just in case. Oh, it's a, it's, a, it's oh high. okay. Okay, so let me show you. Can you see my report? Okay, you can share my report, right? So that's my report totally. And then this is my presentation, right? So that's all the presentation that I have here. So I have the present the, the HTML file, the one that I sent in the like that this HTML file, which is my presentation file. Yeah. But then outside of the in the same repository, outside of this presentation, I have the markdown file here for them. If actually all the file, all the image, all the everything that I use, all examples that I use to generate these presentations are in this folder. Okay. So, oh, you just download it right there where it says code, download, downloads all together. Is that the idea? Download. Uh, it. Oh, if you want to download it, you can. You can. I think you can do like a clone. Yes, maybe yeah. Download, download zip. I'm just trying to figure out how I can go through all the code that you had. Yeah, if you can, you can actually read it from here. For example, like a the basic, like I have this. Uh, let me show you. Like, where where is my Amazon? I know I upload all of them together. Oh, this like the basic one. That's that's the format, the app presentation format. You yeah. can actually read it from there. It's like a. It's like a lot of them. I see. Okay. Okay. But and to actually, actually run it, I would need to download everything. It sounds like. Yeah. If you run it in your, you will only run this same file in your computer. You will have to download the entire report. That's what GitHub does. It doesn't allow you to download just one file or you know. Yeah. Okay. Or image. You will have to download the entire report. And okay. I think the, you can get it by doing this. Uh, GitHub and then Cologne. Okay. Very good. Yeah. So there, there's multiple ways to do it. Um, like it's just basically like loading all of that stuff down. And then, um, mm -hmm. so it's kind of goes back to like we were starting at the beginning, right? Like with the R markdown file, the output's going to be HTML. Mm -hmm. So what I think what Pandoc does is it like it render, it takes all of that code and markdown and puts it into HTML so that when you open that HTML file in your browser, it rent, the browser can render it so that we could, we as humans can read it. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's the biggest thing is if you're going to read the HTML, you could read the HTML, but it's not going to be formatted in a way that we're going to understand it. So you need your browser to actually read that HTML. Cool. It's a lot of good information. It's like, it's just like so many other things, like the more that you learn, the more you realize how much you don't know. So um, for me, it was very informative and uh, I can't wait to like dive into it even more. So, um,